Thank you very much, um, Gemma and GLG. Thanks to the Sohn Foundation. I really believe in the mission. I'm very happy to be here. I am Vijay Shilpi Kandula. I'm presenting ASML as along. ASML is a um, 360 billion euro Netherlands-based company. It's a critical supplier to the semiconductor industry. Before I begin, this is a disclaimer. My employer is uh, a shareholder of this company. Uh, all opinions are mine. So whether it is NVIDIA GPUs, chat GPT, or smartphones, none of them would be possible without ASML. ASML is the supplier of critical lithography systems to the semiconductor industry. These are advanced machines, which basically could be on the order of hundreds of million euros. What these machines do is basically shine light through a fancy stencils, which are called reticles, through which uh, you can now have very intricate patterns patterned on silicon. What ASML basically did is take a very fundamental physics concept of diffraction, where the optical resolution of a system is proportional to the wavelength of light and inversely proportional to the numerical aperture, which is the amount of light that is collected by the system. Um, this is the first zero of a Bessel function, for those who are mathematically inclined. Um, so ASML basically translated that fundamental theoretical physics concept to um, 28 billion euros in annual revenues last year. Now, it took them four decades to achieve this. And how did they do this? They innovated across multiple disciplines, across physics, material science, and precision mechatronics. This is engineering at its best. To give you an example of the kind of advanced engineering that they have, they use flat mirrors. And these mirrors could be on the order of uh, a meter in diameter and flatness being less than 20 picometers. 20 picometers is less than the radius of hydrogen atom. David and Hon was backstage. Uh, I don't have any cartoons to um, reference the chemistry joke here, but he promised me that if I win the contest again next year, he's going to send me a chemistry cartoon for my presentation. David, I'm going to hold you responsible and accountable for that. Um, so this company not only figured out this extremely um, precise engineering, they also have developed deep partnerships across the ecosystem. Um, so they have very high visibility across multiple cycles. In the last analyst day, uh, which is in November 22, a uh, few weeks before ChatGPT was released, they basically gave long-term targets for calendar 2030. Very few companies do that. So now that I gave you the background, I want to now dive into my pitch. In life, as well as investing, process is more important than outcomes. An investor's process basically begins with trying to uncover a mosaic picture. And that mosaic picture better begin with a canvas. And that canvas was something that Warren Buffett set the parameters for for us. Warren Buffett said in 1992 in Berkshire Hathaway letters that the best business to own are the ones for a very long duration have high reinvestment rates and high incremental return on invested capital. ASML did exactly that. In the last 20 years, they compounded intrinsic value at a 17% CAGR, and that came essentially from a 39% reinvestment rate and a 44% return on, incremental return on invested capital. I triangulated between the methods of Joel Greenblatt and John Saber. Thanks for uh, all the education that you provide to the investment community. So this kind of establishes that this is a very high quality business. It's a compounder. Not only that, ASML is an R&D powerhouse. They have thousands of PhDs, they have tens of thousands of patents, and in the last 20 years, on an average, they spent about 20%, on an average, they spent 20% of annual revenues on uh, R&D and CapEx. They invested even through um, the great financial crisis. In a recent interview uh, with um, GSB, um, Jensen Wong, the, the CEO of NVIDIA, uh, mentioned suffering, that is, um, investors, entrepreneurs, and um, enterprises stare into the abyss of uncertainty and stick with their process, and that's what ASML exactly did. After many years, um, they eventually got the extreme ultraviolet um, lithography right. Slowly and then suddenly, uh, there was a nonlinear phase shift in the market. They got a lion's share of the lithography market. They're right now at 80% plus market share in lithography, and they're a near monopoly in UV lithography. 
Speaking of Jensen, I also want to draw a parallel between NVIDIA and ASML. NVIDIA is often thought of as a chips company. It's, it's not exactly a chips company, it's a systems company. It has GPU hardware and networking hardware, which is layered with CUDA software, and each architecture evolution depends on hardware and software improvements. ASML also exactly has the same thing. They have a hardware install base, and they have soft, software control algorithms across this install base, and each architecture evolution happens because of both those improvements. Now, we're not talking about incremental improvements. What we're talking about is disruptive innovation. One configuration that they have, one architecture, is a dual stage architecture twin scan, where basically while one wafer is being exposed to light, the other wafer is not sitting idle, it's being uh, measured. So basically they're doubling the throughput. I call this in my doctoral thesis as a topology chain, that's exactly what uh, ASML did. Um, when you consider competition, they try to, um, if, if you look at um, competition, no one actually uh, copied or reverse engineered this particular technology. Uh, it's been 20 years since TwinScan was there, and so this kind of, um, demonstrates that there's compounding of the scale of experience and expertise that this company has, and it's very hard to disrupt such a competitive moat. Not only is this company a very high business quality company and also has uh, this technology moat, it is also at the right uh, point in the tech cycle. The late Charlie Munger talked about Lollapalooza. ASML has two elements for this Lollapalooza. Number one is a slowing Moore's law, actually increases the capex intensity node over node, whether it's DRAM or uh, logic. So there's an arms race going on between TSMC, Intel, and Samsung, and ASML is the arms dealer. There's also an arms race going on. There's a gold rush going on in, in the memory names, SK Hynix, Micron, and Samsung, where there's a gold rush for high bandwidth memory. When you ask ChatGPT a question, the inference latency is very critical. You want ChatGPT or any other LLM to answer that question very fast. You can't wait for minutes. The, the mission critical, the most important part of a GPU that allows for that is the, the high bandwidth memory. ASML participates in that. The fundamental reason for that, we can go into the physics of it, is DRAM is a capacitor-based construct which doesn't scale well at small scales. So what you have is um, high bandwidth memory gives you the right kind of form factor for you to achieve the kind of latencies that you want and the power conservation that's required uh, in data centers. What I try to show here is a differentiated analysis on the opportunity that ASML will have if, um, if you have basically more adoption of high bandwidth memory. So these are the fundamental dri drivers for EU demand. Um, if you assume uh, in this illustrative framework that I provided here, if you assume GPUs will go from the 192 gigabyte uh, memory capacity that they have right now, if that were to go to 576 gigabyte based on a bunch of systems choices um, that um, GPU makers as well as memory makers will try to do over the next several years, what I come to the conclusion of is if AI servers were to be 20% of total by 2030, you're going to have a substantial increase needed in the total EUV tool capacity compared to the nascent install base of DRAM UVs right now. Markets typically obsess about near-term estimates. What I find a great opportunity for investors in the market to think about right now is to be creative about the long-term capacity needs and the long-term earnings potential of this company based on this gold rush that all these memory makers and large language models are chasing. I'll give you two drivers that are very important and part of this analysis. Number one, Jensen Wong in the last GTC last month um, introduced a new GPU. The, the newest GPU is the B200. Instead of having one die per GPU, it has two dies per GPU, which means it's more wafer capacity that's required to make these GPUs. Number two, M Micron in the latest earnings call, they talked about the wafer intensity for high bandwidth memory being three times that of regular DRAM. That is, for you to get the same kind of bits, the same number of bits as regular DRAM, you need to have three times the wafers. Analysts were modeling this as two times before, and likely in the, in, in the next several years, it's probably going to go four times. So each of these is fundamentally changing the EV tool demand, and that's, that's a tail, uh, tailwind for ASML. The other thesis points that I have are in terms of service revenues. Service revenues are about 20% of total right now. That, I think, has tailwinds in terms of increasing utilization of the install base. Uh, there is also increasing UV um, as part of the mix, and service revenues are at high incremental margins. If you were to compare this to aftermarket of uh, aerospace companies or even other semi-caps, um, this is the kind of thing that LAM Research, for instance, has a third of its revenues from, from service, uh, services, and ASML right now has only about 20%. That, that should uh, go higher from here for the next several years. 
Incentives are everything. Management here is aligned with shareholders. It's a very meticulous, methodical company which focuses on remuneration on both short-term and long-term objectives, which include not only financial metrics, but also very customer-focused metrics like EUV and DV targets. The one thing that I really like is they have a three-year ROIC in the long-term objectives. If the board is listening, I would urge them to also include a five-year plus ROIC. Why? Because high-volume manufacturing is a really challenging task, and we investors are in this for, a long game, for the long game. ASML looks quite attractive on consensus estimates on a, value, on a growth adjusted basis. If you were to compare this against uh, other semi-cap peers or uh, even the much loved MAG7, so I'm, I'm taking here calendar 25 uh, estimates, consensus estimates as my basis for this argument. If you were to think that they would meet expectations, then the stock should re-rate from here. But if they don't meet expectations, I want you to consider two supporting factors. Number one, the semicycle bottomed in calendar 23. Uh, this link that I provide here has a deck uh, in which they go over uh, August 2023 as perhaps being the, the bottom of the uh, semicycle. The other point is in line with that commentary is ASML in the latest uh, annual report, they basically said that um, they see this as the lowest point of the cycle. Um, in, uh, across the install base, they're seeing increasing utilization and then they built inventory for the first time in the history of the company. This is a valuation framework that I have. In the base case, I think they can do a 65 euro EPS uh, in calendar 2030. That is, uh, I have a whole duration of five years for this stock. Uh, this is a compounder. I, I really think this could be a core holding for a, for a, uh, for a, a long holding period. So that, that corresponds to an IRR of 17%. If I were to discount it back to calendar 25, that comes to a peg ratio of less than one. In the bull case, I think the stock can go to um, I think it can achieve uh, 75 euro EPS even with a modicum of the high bandwidth memory opportunity that I discussed before. That corresponds to an IRR of about 20%. Obviously, the bull case is it's not a straight line, straight line path from here. There are probably going to be a couple of cycles. Um, in terms of bear case, um, I underwrite a 25% downside, and the 25% downside bakes in a 25 multiple uh, on my bear case calendar 26 EPS. The bear case basically bakes in a couple of scenarios. Uh, WFE slowdown. China lagging edge right now is pretty strong, and um, th that's because Chinese players are trying to build the local supply chain. If that were to slow down, that's included in this, in this bear case. The other bear case is in terms of um, the, the debate that we constantly have, whether it's AI uh, hype or reality. Um, is it AI pause or real AI winter? In the worst case, if it's an AI winter, if the multiple derates like it did in the cryptocurrency uh, bubble, uh, that's, that's baked into my bear case. So essentially what I see here is 100% upside in the bull case versus a 25% downside in the bear case. I think the risk reward is pretty, pretty asymmetric and interesting. There are a few bare arguments for which I give my detailed rebuttals. I'll not go into that in the interest of time. The one catalyst that I look forward to is um, uh, the uh, analyst day that they're going to have in November of 2024. Uh, the previous analyst day they had was a few weeks before ChatGPT was released, so it'll be pretty interesting to um, listen to what the management thinks about generative AI and the high bandwidth memory opportunity. In summary, um, ASML could be attractive for a core position for a five-year holding period. Um, we investors try to robustify our process in that we look for businesses which are very high quality, businesses which have high visibility, businesses which have alignment of management with shareholders, and ASML checks all those boxes. In life, there are no guarantees. In investing, there are no guaranteed outcomes. What you have control on is your actions, your process. Good processes may eventually lead to good outcomes in the long term. I wish you all a great process. Thank you very much.